Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started on our virtual tour of Malaysian Borneo. Uh, welcome to all of you from around the world. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for this session and this tour. And big thanks to the GLF crew for helping us put this tour together. Um, my name is Jetty, and I'm the director of the Borneo Project. The Borneo Project is a small NGO that supports indigenous-led forest protection and land rights campaigns in the Malaysian state of Sarawak, which is one of two Malaysian states on the island of Borneo. And we always start our events with a land acknowledgement. So I would like to acknowledge that I am currently on the traditional territory of the Pueblo people in New Mexico. Um, in normal times, I'm often in Malaysia on Orang Ulu and Iban land, but right now I'm on Pueblo land. And uh, if you like, I'd like to invite anyone to um, acknowledge the land that they are on as well too, whether privately or in the chat. So as I mentioned, the Borneo Project, my organization, we support indigenous led land rights campaigns and we are based in the US. We've been working directly with communities in Malaysian Borneo for almost 30 years now. And these days we're seeing more and more evidence that shows that strengthening indigenous rights and indigenous land rights is um, an essential component and a, the most effective way to protect forests. And that's how we've been operating for the past three decades. So today on our virtual tour, we're going to take you on a tour of our work in Sarawak. First, we will show you a four minute clip from the film Sunset Over Salungo. This is a really beautiful film about the people and the area where we work so that you can discover what the landscape looks like and how the people of the Salungo River are working to protect their forests. And then after that, we'll be joined by some experts from Malaysian Borneo who will take us on a tour of our current projects and show you what the work actually looks like on the ground. They'll be introducing you to the communities and the people that we work with and discussing what kind of species we're documenting through our community-based socio-ecological survey. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A and we hope to get to all of your questions. So first up, here's a clip from the film Sunset Over Salungo by Ross Harrison. Uh, the Salungo River is a tributary of the Baram River, and a lot of our work takes place along the Baram River and its tributaries. So you'll be hearing those names quite a bit. The Salungo is home to the indigenous Kunya and Punan people, and this particular film features the Punan people who were traditionally nomadic and who have been protecting their forests for decades. It's really beautifully shot and it will give you a great feel of the area where we work.
All right. Well, if you would like to watch the entire film, it's only 30 minutes long and you can watch it for free at www.salungo.com. That's S-E-L-U-N-G-O. So as you just learned in that film, uh, the people of the Upper Bottom River Basin in Sarawak have been organizing to protect their forests for quite some time. And the idea for the Bottom Peace Park started many years ago. Um, in the last few years, it's gained traction with more indigenous groups in the area and with our friends at the Forest Department. And at the Borneo Project, one of our main projects right now is called the Baram Heritage Survey, which is a socio-ecological survey that is laying the groundwork to establish indigenous managed forest protection like the Baram Peace Park. So a traditional ecological survey will typically send in scientists and grad students to collect data. But for our survey, the Bottom Heritage Survey, we have hired and trained people from the communities to collect all of the data. So they're collecting data on wildlife, hunting, fishing, and socioeconomic issues in villages. And this method takes a bit more work and resources and organizing to conduct the survey this way but in the long run, it has a much bigger impact. Um, by training people from communities, we're building their capacity to establish projects and manage forests and manage their land. And plus the data that we're collecting has been directly informed by the village technicians. So the people that we're working to collect the data, they're all hunters and from the villages and they're the real experts here. So they've helped ensure that we're collecting the right data that will be useful to them and for their communities in the long run. So next up, my colleagues will take you on a tour of the Baram Heritage Survey, and they'll show you some of the rare species that we're documenting. Joining us now, we have Fee, Brian, and Shanaz. Fee is the project manager for the Baram Heritage Survey, and she's the communications director at the Borneo Project. A Melbourne native, Fee has trained as a lawyer and a journalist in Australia, West Africa, and South Asia, and she's been working with the Borneo Project for the past three years. Brian is our field manager on the ground. He's from the village of Long Liam, which is a Cayenne village in the middle of Baram River Basin, and he spent his childhood growing up both in Sarawak's capital city and in the remote interior of Borneo. He works for Save Rivers, which is our partner organization based in Miri. And Shanaz is one of the scientists that we're working with. She's from Kuching, the capital of Sarawak, and she's currently pursuing a master's degree in tropical biodiversity at the Institute of Biodiversity and Environmental Conservation. Shanaz's current focus of study is on the association of wildlife and human livelihoods its utilization, importance, and wildlife's role in cultural belief systems of the indigenous communities in the rainforests of Sarawak. Welcome to our virtual tour of the Baram region of Sarawak and the Baram Heritage Survey. To start off, I'd like to ask Brian to tell us a little bit about the Baram River Basin and the people who live there. Okay, uh, the Param River originates in the Babit Highland near the border of Kalimantan or Indonesian border. Uh, it flows north through the tropical forest of Sarawak and then ends in the South China Sea. Uh, the Baram is home to Orang Ulu, which translates to the person of the interior. Uh, the Orang Ulu is a group that includes many different indigenous ethnicities, including the Kenya, Labit, Penan, Saban, Bawang, and my group, Kayan. I'm from the Kayan village of Longliam, which is in the middle of Baram Basin. Uh, most of uh, Orang Ulu groups are traditionally subsistence rice farmers. The Penan were traditionally nomadic, but in the past decades, they have been, uh, become settled and now are growing rice as well. And I'm lucky enough to have been to your village, Longliam, where you cooked me pancakes for my birthday. So thank you very much. <laughs> Shanaz, can you tell us a little bit about the landscape of the Baram River Basin? Sure. So the Baram River Basin, like the rest of the island of Borneo, is covered by tropical rainforest. The upper and middle parts of the river are quiet mountain, mountainous. And to reach the villages in these remote areas, you must take a big truck along very bumpy and winding logging roads. 
Before the roads were built, people used small boats and traveled by foot. Much of the area is forest and some of these forests have been logged quite extensively. There is also quite a bit of agricultural land, which includes small local farmers who grow crops like rice, rubber, oil palm, vegetables and pepper, and also large oil palm plantations that have greatly expanded in recent years. These plantations are especially prevalent in the lower and middle parts of the river. Thanks, Shanaz. And Brian and Shanaz, can you tell me a little bit about what the survey actually does and what your work looks like day to day? All right. I'm the field manager for the Barang Heritage Survey, which means that I travel to all of the communities participating in the survey to collect data, provide any follow-up trainings that are needed, and generally manage the project. I spend time with our data collection technicians and learn what new animals they see each month and help them with any technical issues that arise. And I'm part of the science team and I spend my time partly at school and travel to the villages to help with training and the data collection process as well. Um, my work looks at the association of wildlife in human livelihoods and wildlife roles in cultural belief systems of the indigenous community. Nice. And Brian, can you just tell us a little bit about this footage that we're seeing and what the work of our field technicians looks like? So here is when, our, uh, when we are training our field technician to use the app. We designed the app also using software called CyberTracker. This allows us to create an app in multiple languages and with photos of each of animals and birds. We also designed the app in consultation with our field technicians, which will help us pick up on things we might have missed. We also designed it logically from the local perspective. So instead of categorizing the animals by their scientific or taxonomic group, we categorize them uh, the way the people who live there do. So, uh, for example, we categorize the mammals based on whether they have paw or hands or hoof or claws. Uh, we categorize the birds largely based on what they eat. Uh, this means our app makes sense for the people on the ground who are using. Nice. So I would be a poor mammal, I guess. <laughs> Clouded leopard. <laughs> Clouded leopard. Very nice. Um, Shanaz, can you tell us a little bit more about the research methods for the survey? Sure. So for the study, we are using the line transect distance sampling technique to estimate the abundance and densities of animals in the Maram region. So we have three clusters of villages in each cluster. Our field technicians walk four transects per month, and each of those transects is 4 km long. They walk each transect twice per month, so altogether we are covering 96 kilometers of forest every month, which is quite an achievement on this difficult terrain. Our field technicians look for visual sightings for terrestrial mammals, birds, and reptiles, and also look for animal signs, for instance, gears, scratch, footprints, feathers, wellows, and more. So for the visual sightings, they measure the bearing of animal upon detection from the line and its distance from the observer, which means we are able to measure the density of the animal populations, in particular of terrestrial mammals and birds across the landscape. And this is really important for understanding what exists in this forest. Okay, so I get the methods, but what are we actually finding for the survey so far? Yeah, so far we are discovering many birds, everything from hornbills to the great argus. We're finding lots of primates, such as langurs, gibbons, long and short-tailed macaques. In the Baram region, we also have sun bear, which is the smallest bear in the world, the critically endangered pangolin. Lots of otters, deers, manjacks, and the all-important species, babui, or the bedded pig. Important because it's the most delicious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Brian, can you explain to me a little bit how our field technicians are actually finding all these animals? Uh, because our field technicians grew up in the village hunting and gathering their whole lives, they know the landscape very well. Uh, the technicians are all experts, so they are very good at ident identifying animals and animal signs. For example, they can look at a piece of eaten fruit on the forest floor 
and identifying what kind of animal that ate it um, based on uh, the bite mark and how long ago it has been eaten. Uh, they can look at a scratching on a tree and tell whether it is done by a, a deer or some bear. This is all standard knowledge for those who live alongside the forest. Cool. So it sounds like the survey is finding lots and lots of different animals, and I'm sure we don't have time to discuss them all. But maybe you can tell us about this gibbon that we're seeing. Okay. Our field technicians are finding lots of gibbons, mainly from the sound. Uh, they sound like but one plus is finding a big group of 10 over and over again in one of the transects. It must be the same family hanging up in the territory. These gibbons are quite tame uh, and relaxed to see human, which is unusual. Uh, it is because these gibbons are living in the territory that is reserved for us, meaning it is a protected uh, area by the community from hunting and logging. That's very cool. Um, Shanaz, can you tell us, um, have there been any scientific surprises along the way? Yes, there has. Um, the people in the villages have told us there are two types of deer in the Baram. One that looks smaller and more red and one that is larger with some black. We don't know if this is just a variation based on habitat and diet and they have shared genetics or whether it is a new species. There is a lot still to learn in Sarawak. For example, one of my classmates even found a new species of tupaya and is in the process of getting it genetically confirmed. This is an area of the world that needs a lot more research. Speaking of deer, the lesser mouse deer has a neat trick. They can dive to escape from a predator they are chasing them. I heard that they can uh, hold their breath under the water for up to five minutes. Uh, with this trick, they have enough time to swim away from the predators. I definitely can't hold my breath underwater for five <laughs> minutes. I would be toast. Um, so what is next for the survey? Yeah, so we are pretty excited about the results of the survey so far and its potential to be used in establishing indigenous-led forest management system. We are establishing baseline data for further protection measures. The data in the following analysis that are produced will be used to guide community discussions regarding land management. We also establishing high conservation value, which means that there is a high imperative to protect the forest. At the same time, the method we are using is actually training community members to assess and manage their forest. So the process itself is a way to build capacity in communities. Very nice. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. But I want to thank you, Shanaz and Brian, for your time and for your insights. And I just want to reiterate how excited we are about the survey and its potential to be a stepping stone towards establishing the Barham Peace Park. So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for that virtual tour. Um, we will open it up for a Q&A now live with everyone from the tour. And after the Q&A, we will replay the first clip from Sunset Over Salungo and hopefully have sound with it this time. So here comes Brian. And you can unmute yourself and Shanaz. All right, let's start. All right, so I have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, to start off with, I'd like to ask Brian, what other inspiring forest protection projects are happening apart from the Barham Heritage Survey? Uh, so there are two, um, two uh, activities that, they, uh, that the community in Barham started already by themselves, which is uh, they start to plant uh, trees, set up nursery in their village. And then the other one is, um, uh, river protection, or they call it tagang. Uh, in tagang, they feed fish in wild water, and then uh, in, a, in a long time, there will be a lot more fish come uh, just to feed on, uh, in that area. Yeah. And what's the other project? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> the other project is about uh, reforesting uh, the, the forest that had been uh, cut down. We 
try to select uh, some local trees from uh, which which is uh, which can be park in uh, one of our uh, study area in Slumo. So we get the Blian seeds or the Maranti and the Kapo tree to um, to plant it in the nursery, and then when they grow up to um, they grow up from one one meter tall, and then we start to sell them to uh, any communities that want to buy, and then plant it in their um, forest that had been cut down. And Jetty, same question. What are the other exciting projects happening in the Barham River Basin? Sure. So there's a lot of different community-based projects that are, um, you know, led by communities and championed by communities. We actually have a session following this on Indigenous solutions to global challenges, where we can get into a little bit more detail into all of these. Um, but you know, the communities all have, um, they're all the experts when it comes to their challenges and their solutions. So each village sometimes has their own solution to whatever challenge they're facing. And sometimes they organize and come together in larger projects. So for example, the Bottom Heritage Survey and the Bottom Peace Park are both examples of um, more communities coming together to protect their forests and establish regenerative livelihoods. Um, and then the Tagang system that Brian was mentioning is usually uh, community by community uh, that decides to protect their fisheries and they decide not only on where to help the fish uh, grow, but also when to harvest or when to not harvest. And another really exciting thing is um, the Kunya Jamok community that we're working with in Long Tungan has set up their own private, uh, well, not private, but their own um, forest reserve. So the Bayi Kermun Jamok. And so that initiative um, is basically the village deciding to protect a certain area from any extraction of any kind. And it's already having a big difference. So one of the questions from the audience is how many sun bears are there left in the wild? Um, I don't know if anyone knows the exact number, but Shana's is probably our best bet. Um, can you tell us a bit about how threatened the animals are that live in the Barham area? So um, from our survey, there are a few number of recorded where three sun bears were detected in the region. So that means uh, the population is um, thriving in the region, but we're not very sure how, what is the number in what abundance they are in the upper Baram region. So this is where the project is um, being established, where we can know um, what are the, what is the abundance of sun bear in the upper Baram region. Yeah, so we don't know, but we're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, we're going to find it out. And Brian, can you tell us a little bit more about the two different types of deer? and whether they're two different species or what's the story there? Yeah, so uh, I have experienced seeing two species, two separate species. Uh, the small one is a bit uh, like copper color, uh, close to red. And this one is smaller. The male can grow up to 90 kilos. And then the big one, uh, they grow up to 100, uh, 130 kilo to 200, as one of my uh, Indo Indonesian friends mentioned about it. So the big one is, um, black, gray towards black, and then it has uh, a skin layer on the, on the antlers with a lot of uh, short hairs around the, around the antlers. Yeah, and then, are, um, uh, as mentioned, so now the male can grow up to um, uh, 200 kilograms. And Shanaz, how would we work out if these are actually two different species or if they're the same species and they just look different? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I've never heard about this before. Uh, this is my first time hearing it. So um, actually, um, it may be another species that is not naturally occurring in Borneo. It was um, introduced by uh, people into the island around 17th century. So um, it is called a Javan Rusa or um, Rusa timorensis. It is very similar species to the Rusa that we have now, Sambadir, the only species of deer that can be found in uh, Borneo. This is where the research, uh, research should be done to look into um, whether it is uh, another species or it is the same species 
but just um, different morphologically. So we have to confirm this uh, through genetic analysis and cranial dental measurement. And Brian, maybe you can tell us a bit more about the threats um, to biodiversity in the Byram River Basin. The threats, uh, I would say, um, logging happening so uh, for so long already, and then um, I think it's um, contribute a little bit to the uh, to the reduction of number of some species that give birth for only uh, one pond or maybe two maximum. But as we, uh, as we know, um, survival of the fittest, uh, one pond of for example a deer will be uh, will be left behind, and then they they are unable to survive. So maybe they will be uh, eaten by the predators, and then only, only uh, one pond left. Uh, so uh, most of the deer species, we found it uh, scarce in Baram region compared to uh, other ungulates animals like the bearded pig. Another question from the audience is uh, maybe for Jetty, you could tell us a bit about the Heart of Borneo project and whether it's an effective method for forest and biodiversity protection. Sure. So for those of you who aren't aware, the Heart of Borneo initiative is an agreement between all of the different governments that are on the island of Borneo. So Indonesia, Brunei, and Malaysia. Um, so there's two Malaysian states on the island of Borneo, Sarawak and Sabah. So all of these governments have collectively agreed to protect the Heart of Borneo, So which is a, a really, really important ecological system um, and mountain range really in the heart of the island. It's essential for biodiversity and for, um, you know, the systems to function in the area. So um, the agreement between all of these countries is really important. And I think that it's um, a really good sign of their intentions to protect the area. On paper, um, it's great, but we're also seeing a lot of extraction still happening in the area. There's a lot of logging concessions, there's mining, um, there's mega projects happening, and there's a lot of roads being built, especially major highways. For example, in Sabah, there's going to, there's a road in the works. It hasn't been built yet, but it's planned that will essentially cut the head off of the heart of Borneo. So um, in order for the Heart of Borneo initiative to really have an impact on the ground further, I think that there's still some things that need to be done, um, extraction that needs to be stopped and communities that need to be empowered to protect their forests because they're the best um, guardians of the forests when it comes to um, impactful projects. And Another question we have is uh, for Brian, I guess. Um, how many field technicians do we have? How many villages do they represent? And how much ground do they cover? Yeah, so uh, we have uh, six, six main technicians with um, an addition of uh, two, two, uh, two substitute from two clusters. And one cluster we have not find out uh, the substitute yet. So uh, the size of the land that cover is like, I think uh, Shanas can explain a little bit about the size of the uh, area that they cover. Yeah, for the, you mean for the, uh, the whole study region or only for the transect? I think the transects. Transects, yes, transects. Um, yeah, so for the transects, um, it is actually related to the density estimation. I'm not sure about the whole, um, cluster, but um, for one transect, we are actually covering four times by uh, maybe this is later to be determined because we're not sure it is uh, it is post a sampling that uh, we are going to determine what are the I mean the cutoff distance from the the effective strip width from the transect. So if one transect covered about four times by maybe two hundred meters, sounds like four times by 0 0.2, maybe 0 0.8 kilometer per square we're covering per transect. So it is actually more detailed. Like uh, we have 15 transects, if I'm not mistaken, 15 transects. So uh, that's the area that we're going to use 
uh, for the analysis using distance sampling. Yeah. And when and where will these collected data by the Borneo project be presented and will they be available for public access? Jetty. Yeah, good question. So um, all of this data is going to be analyzed and presented uh, foremost to the community. So this a big component of this research is to provide information to communities so that they can um, have discussions on what, how they want to manage the land and the forest and the animals. So um, that's one really important part of how the data will be used is by the communities. It, we also have a science team that is analyzing this data and will produce um, working papers that we can use in, with all of the stakeholders um, and the government and the leaders of the communities and the NGOs. And then there will also be papers that will be, you know, in peer reviewed journals and things like that. The data, um, the communities are going to determine how they are sharing the data. So because the communities own this data, they're the ones who can decide um, how it's used in the end. So we have um, agreements with our science team about how to use it, and we'll certainly make publications, but details of that and how to share it are going to be up to the communities. And if you want to keep following our work and see the things that are available for public access, of course, you should follow us at borneoproject.org and on social media. Um, is there potential carbon financing of the park, I guess the Bar and Peace Park, and reforestation areas to support community incomes? Yeah, that's something that we're looking into. Um, that's a larger conversation with different government bodies as well. So it's not off the table, but um, there's no, you know, specific um, agreement in that regard yet. And are there any um, education initiatives happening, any activities done to educate people locally, nationally, regionally, globally about the biodiversity of the Barham River Basin? So part of how we're using this data is certainly um, local education. So the, the technicians are reporting back to their communities every month about what we're finding. And uh, what we find will be used to generate discussions in communities and really um, have specific conversations about what about the biodiversity on their land. Um, we're also hoping to bring this um, locally within the cities of Sarawak. And of course, our goals to uh, educate the global community about these are through social media channels from Save Rivers and from Borneo Project um, at events like these and any other opportunities that we find. And one thing that's really cool is we keep getting this data back every month and there's always new surprises and new animals. Um, that's my favorite bit hearing about. Brian, maybe you can share some of the surprises that we got in the September data this month. Uh, oh yeah, in September data we find, uh, in, in the previous month, we don't find any animals, like for example, uh, I think the yellow throat of Martin is one of them. And then two species of cats, uh, which is the, um, the leopard cat and the red bay cat, but uh, it's not visual, it's only sign. So this is uh, enough to prove that uh, this animal still exists in um, uh, now start to come back since uh, the logging stopped in some of the area that we study. So less disturbance means less stress to the animals, to the sensitive animals, especially the feline species, now that they come back to their uh, uh, natural habitat slowly. And we didn't talk about it that much. We mainly talked about the transect data, but we also have this hunting return data and fishing return data. Shanas, can you explain the significance of that information? Uh, yeah, uh, for hunting and fishing uh, survey. So um, for hunting, it is actually the most, one of the most crucial components of the study because um, 
this is where we're going to uh, gain insights into the importance and significance of wildlife meat for the community. And uh, we're going to correlate between the density and abundance of animals that they harvest every month, especially of wildlife, with the amount of animals that they harvested through hunting. And from this, we can um, like um, find we can know the significance of uh, wildlife meat. Uh, what are the driven factors for hunting, and what are the frequency uh, of hunting re, uh, hunting survey in the region? And also, we can um, gain uh, more information about uh, forage area of the local community. And the other category of data that we're collecting is the social survey. Jenny, can you tell us a little bit about that and the significance of that information? Sure. So um, our technicians are interviewing every adult in their communities on social data, on ecological data, um, but also really importantly on their views and opinions about their land and how it should be managed and what their visions of the future are like. So these questions are intended to generate conversation um, at the finish of the project so, so that they can um, finalize their management decisions on their forest together. All right, well, thank you for your insights, everyone. Um, I think we're going to have another go at screening the Sunset Over Salungo video, hopefully this time with sound. Um, so thanks, we'll pass over. And for those of you who are interested, we do have another session starting in about 20 minutes. Um, so thanks to GLF for helping us put this together and thanks so much to all of you for joining us. <laughs>